This is Pastor Jack Hiles, sitting in the auditorium of the First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. With me today, we have Deacon Doug Hiles and his wife, Kathy. Doug is a fine, faithful member of our church, and his lovely wife is one of our fine, soul-winning ladies. Six years ago, I went to visit Mr. and Mrs. Hiles at their home in Calumet City, Illinois, at 233 153rd Place. That Saturday evening, while on my way to deacon's meeting, I felt a burden to go by their home. I knocked on the door. Mrs. Hiles came to the door, and in just a few moments, Doug had received Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. We're going to relive this experience and show you exactly the methods used and the plan offered to Doug and show you the exact experience of his salvation. Now, to be sure, we have forgotten many of the minute details, but we hope to relive it so as to show you exactly how to win a soul to Jesus Christ. I would like to spend one hour with you trying to help you in your personal soul winning. The greatest business in all of the world is personal soul winning. This could be the most important hour that you've ever spent, apart from the hour when you receive Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. I would like to help you to become a more effective and efficient soul winner for the Lord Jesus Christ. Many years ago, a Baptist deacon came to me and said, Jack, I believe that you could be a soul winner. I was a timid boy, much an introvert. I thought that I never could do anything, much less something so important and wonderful as being a personal soul winner. But this Baptist deacon persisted and insisted that I try to become a soul winner. His name is Jesse Cobb. He is even yet a deacon at the Hillcrest Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas. How I thank God that he encouraged me, as I plan to encourage you, to enter into the greatest business in all of the world. I would like to talk to you for a few minutes about soul winning, and after we discuss this important subject, we're going to ask Doug and Kathy to help us relive the experience when Doug came to Jesus Christ. I might say that though our names are pronounced the same, they're not spelled the same. Mine is spelled H-Y-L-E-S, and Doug's is H-I-L-E-S. However, this is the only person that I have ever won to Jesus Christ outside of my own family who has my name. And so now let's discuss for a few moments this important subject of soul winning. I'm going to ask you to use your pencil and take notes. I will list the number and then give you the point one after another and line upon line and precept upon precept. Number one, may I suggest that you have a definite time to go soul winning. By that I mean, schedule in your activities a number of hours each week given wholly to personal soul winning. I would suggest that if any person is going to be a successful soul winner, he should give at least four hours a week. Perhaps you could go the same day every week, and even the same hour of the same day. But if you will schedule it in your busy week's activity, then you will win more souls. In many respects, it's a matter of volume. You just keep going and keep going and keep going. And then the Holy Spirit, finding that you really mean business, opens doors and hearts so that you might become a soul winner. Have a definite time to go. Let this time prompt you to go. I recall I was in the city of Tacoa, Georgia, many years ago at a conference grounds called the Lake Louise Conference Grounds. A little lady came to me and said, Pastor, would you pray that God would give me a burden to be a soul winner. And I said, only on one condition, and that is if you'll win souls while you're waiting for the burden. Having a burden for souls is a wonderful thing. But not having a burden for souls is no excuse for not being a soul winner. The greatest reason to win souls is because God has commanded us to do so. Obedience is the reason. We win souls for the same purpose that we brush our teeth or take a bath or comb our hair or come to church. You're supposed to. Decent people obey their superiors and those in authority. God has commissioned us to go soul winning, to be the right kind of obedient Christian. We must obey his command. Have you a definite time to go soul winning? Do not let anything keep you 
from fulfilling this obligation. Number two, be soul conscious. Now, what do I mean by being soul conscious? By this I mean everywhere you go, ask people if they're saved. Have you ever witnessed to your barber about his soul? Have you ever witnessed to your beautician about her soul? How about the newsboy who comes by your house every week or month? How about your bread man, the milkman, the groceryman, the druggist? Have you ever witnessed to them? It has been my joy through these years to win people to Christ in almost every situation. I have won people to Christ in airplanes, bus depots, shine parlors. I recall one day I won a shine boy to Jesus Christ and got so excited I forgot to pay him. <laughs> Later, I went back and paid him. One day in Houston, Texas, I was staying in a motel. Came back after the morning service to, to hear a noise in my room. I entered the room and found that the maid was in the bathroom cleaning out the bathtub. She was down in the bathtub cleaning out the ring. And so I witnessed to her. And there she was saved. In most any experience of life, you can be a soul winner. Less than 300 yards from where I sit now, I led a barber to Jesus Christ while he was cutting my hair. Be soul conscious. The reason most of us are not soul winners, my friend, is because we're ashamed of Jesus Christ. We're not willing to ask a stranger if he knows Jesus. What a shame it is for those of us who have been redeemed by his precious blood, born again by his wonderful Holy Spirit, to be ashamed of Christ. Be soul conscious. Everywhere you go, say, Are you a Christian? Have you been saved? Are you born again? Do you know that if you died, you would go to heaven? The next time you go to a restaurant to eat, witness to the waitress. The next time you go on a trip, witness to the person sitting beside you. The next time you get a haircut, witness to your barber. The next time you go to the drugstore, witness to your druggist. Everywhere you go, be a soul winner. My good friend, Dr. Walter Wilson, says that Psalm 126.6, which says, He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed, that that means he that goeth forth and weepeth having a leaky seed basket. Just spread your seed everywhere, and blessed be God, some of it will grow. Number three, be clean and neat as you go soul winning. No salesman should be more neatly dressed than the soul winner. We should do our best to be the very best representative of Jesus Christ that we possibly can be. To do this, we must be careful that we're clean, freshly bathed, we must be careful about our breath. We must be sure that we are the very best we can be for the Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't it seem that a person representing Jesus should be more interested and concerned about his appearance than a person representing a tea company or an insurance company? Why, certainly. Let us be clean and neat as we go out to witness for Jesus Christ. Number four, use a testament and not a Bible, as you go soul winning. If you do use a Bible, use a small one that is not visible. This is tremendously important to a soul winner. If you carry with you a large Bible, people will see as you come up the sidewalk your Bible, and oftentimes will not even open the door. One little girl came to the door once and said to me, after seeing my Bible, Mommy just told me to tell you that she isn't at home. I could not witness to the mommy because I had revealed the purpose of my visit prematurely. Use a testament. Hide it. It is your weapon. It is your sword. Keep it secret and uh, do not reveal it until the proper time. Number five, as you go soul winning, go two by two. Now, oftentimes, I have to go alone in soul winning. And oftentimes, I win people to Christ while witnessing alone. Sometimes even I found three in a group going soul winning together. It is, however, far better for two to go together. Two is the perfect number in soul winning. Here is the reason. The Bible says that one shall chase a thousand, two shall put ten thousand to flight. There is certainly strength in numbers. Then there is a certain kind of courage that comes by having someone with you. I must confess that though I've been preaching for nearly 21 years and winning souls for more years than that, 
I must still confess that when I'm with someone who's a Christian, it is easier for me to ask someone else to become a Christian. Then, of course, there's the prayer strength that two receive when together. But I think the far greatest need is for the person not doing the soul winning to prevent any interruptions from the conversation. That means if the doorbell rings while the soul winner is talking to the lost person, the other one can answer the door. Here are some things that I have done while my soul winning partner was witnessing. I have played hopscotch with children. I have played dolls. I have played mommy and daddy. And by the way, I have been the mommy as well as the daddy. I have watered beans that were burning, answered the telephone, talked to a vacuum cleaner salesman for an hour. I have done whatever was necessary to keep the conversation on the soul winning and to keep any interruption from bothering the lost person from hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. I must say that twice I have changed the baby's diapers while soul winning. In each case, I knew the lost person. The baby began to cry. I said, I'll take care of the baby. <laughs> Little did I realize what I was saying. Whatever it is, do not let an interruption keep the person from hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The greatest need of every individual is to know and hear the gospel and accept it. One day, a little girl came and said, I want to see my mommy. I want a drink. My assistant pastor was winning the mommy to Jesus. I said to the little girl, I'm sorry, sweetheart, but you'll not be able to go in now. Yes, I will, she said. No, I said, you will not go in. Mommy is being saved. Let's play together. I don't want to play, she said. But I said, you cannot go in. And she said, and just what's going to keep me from going in? I doubled up my fist, put it up before my face and said, this, honey, will keep you from going in. <laughs> she didn't go in. Now, of course, I would not have hit the little girl, but I must keep anything from interfering. Here is a lady at the most crucial hour of her life. Here is a lady hearing the greatest story she's ever heard. I must prevent interruptions. Therefore, two going together, I think, is far better. Number six, go with different people. The purpose for this is obvious. When two good soul winners go together, one is oftentimes wasted. When two people become efficient soul winners, it is best that they divide and choose others to train. This, I think, is the most effective way of multiplying soul winners. When I assume a new pastorate, one of the first things that I do is to choose several people whom I think could be good soul winners. I ask them to go with me. They go with me, see how it's done, observe the saving of the souls, and then they, before long, are able to go alone. So if you're going soul winning with the same old partner week after week and both of you are effective soul winners, why not divide and train others to be soul winners? Number seven, claim the fullness of the Holy Spirit before you go. To be sure, this will not suffice for the agonizing in prayer for many hours that every Christian needs to do. This will not suffice for praying all night. I do not know how many nights in my ministry, in my life, that I have seen the sun rise in the morning, in hours of need, in hours of burden, in hours of sorrow, in hours of heartache, in hours of needing an experience with God. So many have been the nights when the sun has risen to find me still on my knees in prayer. This, however, will not suffice for claiming the fullness of the Spirit each time you go soul winning. Each time before leaving, simply bow your head and say, Dear God, I claim in faith the fullness of the Holy Spirit as I go today. Help me to be a blessing. Help me to win someone to Christ. Help us to help another to find the Savior. Number eight, go believing. Go believing. By this I mean expect to see people saved. Far too many of us have the idea that God is not interested in saving anybody. But if we talk to him long enough and beg long enough, God may condescend to come and save a soul. No, my precious friend, God gave his son that people might be saved. Jesus left heaven 
and spent 33 homesick years from the Father and the home in heaven that people might be saved. God gave the best that he had. The heartbeat of God is to see people saved. The tragic truth is God can't find anybody that will be used to be a soul winner. And so if you are willing to be used of God and pay the price to be a soul winner, expect God to save someone. I recall as a kid preacher, and I do mean a kid preacher, in the Sand Hills of East Texas, I did so want to be a soul winner. And I tried, but I failed. Oh, I won a few, but every time I would win someone, I must confess, I would be a little bit surprised. One glad day, it dawned upon me that God wanted to save souls, and that God would use me. And I said that day to God, I believe that you can use Jack Hiles. I know that I'm timid. I know that I'm not very gifted. I know that I'm not as talented as the other young preachers. But I also know that God can use me. I went out that day with a newfound faith in God, the faith that God could use me, the faith that God would save souls. No longer would I be surprised if I had people saved, but rather I would expect it. That day, Doug, I won 12 adults to Jesus Christ. Twelve adults to Jesus Christ. I could call their names, most of them, even to this day, though many years have passed. Expect God to save people. We had a deacon in one of our previous pastorates who would go out soul winning with me. When he would come to the place of asking the person to receive Jesus Christ, the person sometimes would say, no, not tonight. This deacon would jump three feet in the air and run over to the fellow and point his finger in his face and say, what do you mean not receiving my Jesus? He was surprised. He was shocked that anyone could turn down the gospel. If you would be an effective soul winner, go believing. Number nine, be nice and courteous. Isn't it strange that I would have to say that? However, I know many people who find it cute to be offensive in soul winning and think that they're being somewhat of a combination of Elijah and John the Baptist when they scold people while winning folks to Jesus Christ. Now, to be sure, I believe in preaching straight and hard. A little boy in Texas called me Brother God. I'd be preaching along some morning on hellfire and brimstone, as I often do, and I think preachers ought to do. And this little boy would look at his mother and say, Mommy, ain't God mad today? He thought I was God. Now, I think a preacher ought to breathe the fires of judgment. I think we ought to remind people there's a hell to shun. But as we go into their homes and become their guests, converse with them about Jesus Christ, we ought to always be nice kind, and courteous. I recall a preacher one time visiting with me. A lady came to the door who was barely clad and had a cigarette in her mouth. This preacher waxed eloquent as Elijah of old and said, Sister, if you'll get that wicked weed out of your mouth and put some clothes on, we may talk to you. She slammed the door in our face, and I cannot say that I blame her a great deal. Now, I do not believe that a cigarette makes the lady look any more feminine. In fact, I think it makes her look a lot more sinful. And I certainly believe that ladies ought to dress modestly and decently to bring glory to Jesus Christ. But I doubt if it's my job to go from house to house telling ladies how to dress. My job is to go from house to house telling them that Jesus died for them and that he'll save them from sin. And then the Holy Spirit will help me to teach them how to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're going to be an effective soul winner, you must love people. You must be concerned about people. You must be nice and kind to people. I was out soul winning a few years ago in East Chicago, Indiana. A little lady came to the door, opened the door about two inches, stuck her big long nose through the two inches and said, Hello? I said, How do you do? I'm Pastor Hiles from First Baptist Church of Hammond. Yes, she said, I know who you are. And then she proceeded to make this comment. I visited your church. The singer sang too fast. The pianist played too fast. You preached too fast. And I could not get out of the building fast enough. Then she said, If all I've heard about you is true, you're not much. I confess that there were things that I had I thought about doing. An unkind retort came through my mind. 
But I thought, no, this is not what Jesus would do. And so I looked at the lady and I said, Lady, you're right. I'm not much. And I hate me work more than you. And I become more impatient with my faults than you do. For many years, I've tried to do better. I've tried to be a good Christian. But I find so many faults and so many weaknesses and failures. I said, would you pray for me now that I'd be better? But that time she had tears in her eyes. And she said, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. In a few minutes, she too was a child of God. Do you recall the story in Aesop's fables about the wind and the sun arguing about who could take the coat off of the fellow? The wind blew and blew and blew, but the fellow wrapped his coat tighter around his breast. The sun began to shine with its warm rays, and the man removed his coat. This is a lesson for soul winners. Number ten, be complimentary while soul winning. When entering the home... Find something to brag on. Maybe it's a new chair, or a beautiful sofa, or a lovely picture, or a beautiful carpet. Maybe it's a little toe-headed, snotty-nosed kid that's running across the room that grips your heart. Love the child. Compliment him. Every soul winner must love people and must be interested in people's interests, desires, and likes. Be careful to compliment not only in soul winning, but all the time. Be on the lookout for things that are lovely and beautiful and compliment people. I recall in Texas many years ago, we had an insurance man who bothered me to death. He came by my house day after day, and he would say, if you loved your family, you'd have more insurance. And I would say, if I took your advice, they'd starve to death now waiting for me to die. And he and I would really go round and round. One day I was out working in the yard, and I saw his car coming down the street, and I said to my wife, I'm going to go out in the street, I'm going to meet him in the street, lean up against his door so he can't get out. He will not bother me today. So he drove up, and sure enough, he parked in front of my house. I leaned up against the driver's side and said hello and grinned with a confident assurance. He did not even look at me. He looked at my little four-year-old daughter and said, Hello there, sweetheart. You're a beautiful little thing. And then my little boy, David, who was barely a toddler, became toddling across the yard. Hello there, fella, said the insurance man. You look just like your dad. I said to the man, won't you get out and come in? I still have the policy. You see, complimenting is certainly always in order. Number 11, be careful about going in. Ask God to give you prudence and wisdom about going in. If it is obvious the person does not want you to enter, do not enter. Be careful and wise about knowing when and how to enter the home. Number twelve, be a good listener. Let them talk of their interests for a while. Let them talk about their work, their hobbies. Chat for a while about the family. Be a good listener. The world is hungry today for someone to listen. Yesterday, a lady came to my office. She wanted some advice. For about 45 minutes, she talked with me. I said, not many words. I would say, oh, well, oh, oh, God bless you. I'll declare, oh, I'm sorry. And for about 45 minutes, that's all I said. And uh, 45 minutes later, she left, a smile on her face, problems all gone. And she said, Pastor, you always have the best advice. I simply listened. Most everyone has a problem or a burden. You listen to it. You will find a way to talk to them. You'll find an opening. You'll find their interest and their needs. And then you can talk more intelligently to them about the Savior. Number 13, only one should do the talking. Only one should do the talking. When two people go soul winning, they should find very quickly the one that seems to have the inroad with the lost person. And that one should do all of the talking. The other should, should not interrupt, should not say much after the gospel is being presented. The second party should do what I mentioned a while ago. Open the door. Answer the door. Answer the telephone. 
water the beans, play hopscotch, play mommy and daddy, play ball, uh, keep the children from interfering. Be sure that no one interferes. Do not allow both soul winners to talk. Only one do the talking. Number 14, stay on the subject. The subject is Jesus Christ. The subject is the way to heaven. If someone says, well, what do you believe about dancing? A deeply sidestep. Answer it something like this. Well, that's an interesting question. What do you believe about dancing? Well, they say, I don't, I just believe thus and so. That's a good thought. Now back to the gospel in the book of Romans. Suppose someone asks you, what do you believe about closed communion or sprinkling for baptism? Immediately say, what do you think about it? And then after they express their opinion, say, that's very interesting. You have given it some thought, have you not? And then back to the subject. Do not divide them over anything until it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number 15, get the gospel to them some way. Be sure before you leave the house, you get the gospel to them. Now, if you can, read it to them in the Bible and show it to them in the Bible. If they will not allow you to, to read it to them or show them in the Scripture, then quote it to them. For example, suppose a man says, I just not, I don't have time to listen. Do not bother me. I must, I must go. Say, well, I'm sorry. Then I'll not take time to read it to you. But let me ask you this question. You do know that Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, do not, no, no, not one. And then quote the gospel to him. Now, if he will not listen to you, quote it. Pray it to him. Before you leave, bow your head and say, dear Lord, I thank you that Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one, and pray the gospel to him. You may be the last soul winner that'll ever be in that house. You may be his only hope for heaven. You be sure you get the gospel to him. Number 16, stay in the same book of the Bible. I think it is very important that we do this. There are many books in the Bible which can give the entire plan of salvation without going throughout the Bible and seeming to confuse the lost man. One could stay in the book of John and win a soul. One could explain the entire plan of salvation without leaving even the book of Isaiah. One could explain salvation in Galatians or in Ephesians or in the epistles of John. The book that I prefer, however, is the book of Romans. I call it the Roman road. We'll show you in a few moments, what we mean. Number 17, draw a map in your New Testament. Listen very carefully, for this is the way that we train people to become soul winners immediately after they're converted. We suggest that a person start with Romans 3.10. That's all the scripture they have to find. If you can get your Bible marker or book marker and put it at Romans 3.10, you can win a soul without knowing one scripture by memory. We ask the new Christian to underline Romans 3.10 and right beside that to write Romans 3.23. This shows the soul winner where to go next. After each verse, he writes the next verse. The lost man does not see this marking. This is for the soul winner, enabling even a new Christian to be a soul winner even though he does not know by memory one single verse in the Bible. Number 18, ask the unsaved person this question. Do you know if you died today that you would go to heaven? I have tried most of the questions. I have asked, are you a Christian? Have you been born again? Have you been regenerated? Are you saved? This, however, becomes confusing. When I ask a man, are you saved? He answers, saved from what? If you ask a man if he's been regenerated, he may wonder if you're having car trouble. I think it's a good idea to come right to the point. Now, I may start saying, are you a Christian? But before I go to the next place, I always ask this question. Do you know if you died today, you would go to heaven? Number 19. Would you like to know you would go to heaven if you died today? Ask him, would you like to know? Which leads us to number 20. Ask him, if I showed you how you could know, would you do what the Bible says? These three questions lead us into the opportunity to win him to Jesus Christ. Now carefully listen. If he says, 
No, I do not know I would go to heaven. Then tell him how to be saved. If he says, I'm not sure, ask him if he would like to be sure and treat him just like an unsaved person. If he says, I'm just not real positive, ask him if he would like to be real positive. If he says, I think I would go to heaven, ask him if he would like to know that he would go to heaven. You see, anything less than a positive, yes, I know I'm saved, I know I would go to heaven if I died. Anything less than that, you should treat him as a lost man. Oftentimes I have gone through the entire plan, and a person has prayed the sinner's prayer and seemingly been converted, and then they said, well, I did this once before. And then I go back and explain to them that they were saved. Number 21, show him... He is a sinner. Get your pencil now and write these scriptures, for here is the Roman road that we have used. For over 18 years, I have used this Roman road. It has become quite famous. Tracts have been written about the Roman road. The Roman road of salvation has become known around the world by people who have learned to become soul winners from this simple little course. Here are the scriptures. Number 21, show him he is a sinner. Romans 3.10 and Romans 3:23. Number 22. Show him the price on sin. Romans 5:12 and Romans 6:23. Number 23. Show him Jesus paid the price. Romans 5:8. Number 24. Show him by faith in Christ he may be saved. Romans 10, 9 through 13. Number 25. After showing him these points of salvation, review the main points, asking him if he does realize that he is a sinner, if he does realize that sinners are lost and on their way to hell, if he does believe that Jesus Christ became his sacrifice and died on the cross, bearing his sins in his own body on the cross. Asking him, does he believe that if he by faith would look to Christ as his Savior and by faith receive Jesus Christ as his hope for heaven, does he believe that God would save him? Review these main points to be sure he understands the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number 26, ask him if you may pray. Simply like this, could we have a prayer together? Let me pray that you would receive Christ today. If he agrees to this... Pray a simple prayer. Do not pray a long prayer. Do not say, Thou the great God of Jeroboam and Rehoboam and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Don't do that. Pray a simple prayer, something like this. Dear Lord, thank you that this dear friend has received the truth today and that he's been so kind and gracious. And I pray today that you'll help him receive Jesus Christ. May this be the hour of hours for him when he says, Yes, I do trust the Savior. A prayer like this will be sufficient. Interrupt yourself in the prayer. Do not say amen, but interrupt yourself and then lead, which leads us to number 27, ask him to pray. End your prayer abruptly and say something like this. Now, dear friend, wouldn't you like to pray? Wouldn't you like to ask God to forgive your sins and tell him that you are today receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior and trusting him to take you to heaven when you die? Go ahead and pray. God will hear you. Pray now. Ask Him to pray. Number 28, ask Him to take your hand. After He has prayed, then you say, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, would you be willing right now to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you meant the prayer that you just prayed, while our heads are bowed and while God is speaking to your heart, If you would be willing just now to receive Christ as your Savior, man to man, would you take my hand? Which leads us then to number 29. You pray again. While he's holding your hand, you say, Dear Lord, thank you that this friend has received Christ today and that as far as we know he's saved, if he's been sincere, he's your child. Thank you for this. Amen. Which leads us to number 30. Ask him after he prays. Where, according to the Bible, would you go if you died now? Do not ask him how he feels. Ask him 
Where, according to the Bible, would he go if he died then? You may show him John 3.36, or John 3.18, or John 3.16, or John 5.24. Each verse saying, if you believe on Christ, you have eternal life. Each of these verses would say about the same thing in different words. And then you ask him, do you believe on Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you received him in faith today? He replies in the affirmative, yes, I have. And then you ask, then according to the Bible, where would you go if you died now? Number 31, ask him to tell someone immediately that he's been saved. If his wife is in the other room, ask him to go tell his wife that he's been saved. If the father or mother or brother or sister or friend, or maybe he can call someone on the telephone, but as soon as possible, ask him to tell someone that he's been saved. Number 31, lead him to come to the services the next Sunday and walk the aisle making a public profession of his faith. This simply means that he walks the aisle and the pastor tells the people that he's been saved. This makes him claim Christ openly and lets the entire world know he has become a child of God. Number 32, go by and get him the next Sunday. Number 33, sit with him in the services of the church. Number 34, walk the aisle with him, making it easier for him. And number 35, be his pal, be his buddy. Help him to grow in grace. He is your baby. Care for him as a newborn babe in Jesus Christ. This concludes our list of soul-winning suggestions. And now we turn to my friend Doug Hiles. Not related by blood, but related by the blood of Jesus Christ. Doug and Kathy are with me today. On October the 1st, 1960, late in the afternoon or perhaps even early in the evening, I knocked on the door of a little an apartment in Calumet City, Illinois. Kathy came to the door. In a few moments, she invited me in. Finding that Doug was not a Christian, I opened the Bible and began to explain to Doug what it means to become a child of God. In a few moments, Doug was saved. Doug and Kathy are here today. And we're going to start with a knock at the door and briefly relive this experience. To be sure, we cannot spend as much time as we did that evening on October the 1st, 1960. But we will give you an abbreviated picture of the experience that we enjoy together. And so I take you to 233 153rd place in Calumet City. You're my soul winning partner. Would you water the beans and play hopscotch with the children and lend me one ear so you may hear the soul winning conversation? We get out of the car. We go around to the back. We walk up the stairs and the rear apartment upstairs. We knock on the door. Would you go with me? Hello. Hello. Mrs. Hiles? Yes? I am Brother Jack Hiles, pastor of the First Baptist Church in Hammond. How do you do? You have a lovely name. Uh, yours is spelled H-I-L-E-S, is it not? That's right. And mine is spelled H-Y-L-E-S. I wonder if maybe our great, 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 great grandfathers didn't come over on the Mayflower. <laughs> Maybe they even horse thieves together or something. <laughs> but uh, uh, perhaps the, the spelling has changed through the years. But, you know, I've never seen anyone in all of my life outside my own family named Hiles. And so it's very interesting to me that we have the same name. Not too common. I it guess. is not too common. No. Um, Mrs. Hiles, uh, I understand you were in our services recently, is this right? Yes, Wednesday, uh, Sunday and Wednesday. Oh, wonderful, yes. wonderful. And uh, let's see, Sunday morning or evening? Uh, both services. Oh, both services yes. Sunday. Mm -hmm. Well, wonderful. And again on Sunday evening. Yes. And Wednesday evening also. Yes. Was your husband with you? Not on Wednesday. Not on Wednesday. Would you like to come in? Well, thank meet you. Him? Thank you. I will. My, it's nice to be inside. It's a little cool out here. Yes, sir. And who plays the guitar, Kathy? Doug. Oh, is that right? Uh, this is Doug. Oh, hello, uh, Doug. How are you? Preacher from how are you? I'm glad to know you. I'm Pastor First Baptist Church, Doug. Yes. We are so glad that you came to see us last Sunday. 
And uh, Kathy tells me you're a guitar player. Is that right? Yes, I've uh, played a little bit. Is that a fact? Yes. Um, where do you play, Doug? <clears throat> well, I'm not playing anywhere now. Before we moved here, I did a little work in Nevada in some of the clubs. Oh, did you? Yes. In Nevada, in some of the clubs Yes, in well, I was in service out there. Well, how interesting. Well, I, I admire a fellow who plays the guitar. What kind of guitar is this, Doug? It's a Gretsch. A Gretsch? Yes. Sir. Is it steel or standard? Or? Oh, well, it's a regular Spanish guitar. Oh, regular Spanish guitar. Yes. Wonderful. You folks new in town, are you? Yes, we are. Well, fine. Where'd you move from? We came down from Wisconsin. I was attending school up there. Oh, a school. where did you go to school there? I went to uh, Milwaukee uh, School of Engineering for a while, and then I switched over and went to the Automation Institute, IBM school. You have a varied background. Wisconsin yes. and Nevada and... Uh, guitar playing and engineer tra engineering training and so forth. Well, that's tremendous. Where do you work here, uh, Doug? You're, you're employed here in our area? Yes, I'm with the uh, Lever Brother Company. Oh, Lever Brother yes. Company. What do you do there? Well, I'm an IBM operator. And did you learn this in Wisconsin at school? Yes, in the uh, Automation Institute. There. I see. How do you like it here? I like it real well. I hope you'll like it. We want to welcome you to our area, and we're, we're glad that you're here, and we do trust that, that you'll enjoy living in the Calumet region. I am also want to say on behalf of our people that we're so glad that you came to see us last Sunday. It's always a joy to have visitors, and we're glad that you came. It's we, a large church. It is a large church. <laughs> <laughs> we enjoyed the choir very much. Oh, you enjoyed the choir. Yes. Wonderful. Well, that's good. You know, uh, I like good music. I guess you do because you play the guitar. I think you'll find this, Kathy. Uh, of course, we do have a lot of people, but uh, I think you'll find our church to have a What's the word? A little type spirit, maybe. Uh, we don't play big. We don't act big. Actually, we're, we're just a lot of little people. And we ju just love the Lord. And you'll find it, I think you'll find after you've been here a while, that we're like the, the country church back home. And uh, we hope you'll come back and see us again. Thank you. What church uh, do you uh, belong to, Kathy? Do you have a church membership? Uh, yes, uh, in Nevada. I was a Southern Baptist. Oh, is that a fact? Yes. Then you, you have been saved, have you? Yes, I have been. Do you ca know, Kathy, that if you died to, to the, tonight, you'd go to heaven? I certainly do. Well, wonderful. When were you saved? When I was about 13. Well, that's good. I'm so glad. Mm -hmm. Doug, you a Baptist, too? No, I, I was raised Methodist. Uh, we've been just looking around in the area for a church. We've been investigating the Catholic religion. Oh, I see. And, uh, then you were reared a Methodist, were you? Yes. My mother was reared a Methodist and oh, is that uh, right? became a Baptist after I started going to the Baptist church. But you are now attending the Catholic church, are you? Well, we've uh, attended some in Wisconsin. We've just went to a few around here. We're looking for for a church. I and, see. And you're interested in the Catholic religion? Yes, we've been looking into it. Well, that's very interesting. We have almost an ecumenical movement right here, don't we? Uh, I'm a Baptist, and Kathy is a Southern Baptist, and you're a Methodist, and you're, uh, th you're attending the Catholic Church. You know, the wonderful thing about it is, Doug and Kathy, you don't have to belong to a church to go to heaven. And it does not matter what church you belong to. If you do know Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, you can go to heaven regardless of the church. I often say the church is like a bus station. It doesn't take you to your destination. It's simply a good place to meet the bus that will. And so the transportation to heaven is Jesus Christ. A lot of people meet him at church, but you can flag a bus down on the highway too and catch it so you can be saved at your home, and your home as well as you could at church. Let's forget for a few moments, Doug, that I'm a Baptist and that you're considering Catholicism. And let's just think about one thing. I know in our Baptist churches, oftentimes people come to me and say, Pastor, though I've been a Baptist for many years, I really do, do not know that I'm going to heaven. And I'm sure that even in the Catholic Church or even the Methodist Church, there may be numbers of people that may belong to the church, but as many Baptist folks do not really know that if they died, they'd go to heaven. Let me ask you, Doug, do you know that if you died tonight, you would go to heaven? Well, I, I don't think anybody can really know until they're... Until, uh... They die and uh, I see. Then you feel that a person cannot know that he's saved until he dies. Is this true? Yes. But yes, Kathy. And I'm sure that uh, Doug's a Christian. He reads his Bible a lot. I see. Well, that's admirable. I'm sure that the fact that you've been to the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, and now looking into the Catholic religion, that means that you're sincere and you do want to know the truth. I'm sure of that. And you strike me, Doug, as being a very sincere man. Let me ask you this, Doug. Suppose that I could show you in the Bible how you could know that if you died, you would go to heaven. And then you could see that a person could know. If you could see it and see what to do, 
would you do it? Yes, I, I believe I would if I could agree with you on that point. In other words, if you could agree that, that the Bible does teach you can know, then you would do it. Yes. Of course, 1 John 5, 13 says, um, These things that I have written unto you that believe on the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. But I want to go a little further into it. Then you would, if you could see what to do, and you could agree with me on it, what the Bible teaches, you would do it if you knew what yes, to do. Yes, if I knew. Wonderful. There are only four things that you have to know to go to heaven. The Bible says, so now then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so you're right. A person should investigate in the word of God what they should do in order to be a Christian. The first thing that you have to know is that you are a sinner. Let me show you here in the Bible, Doug, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. I want you to notice this first thing I mentioned, that we must know that we're sinners if we go to heaven. You see it right here? Romans 3 and verse 10. As it is written, there is none... Righteous. Righteous, that's right. No, not one. You see that? Yes. Now, this entire third chapter of Romans tells us the condition of the heart of man. Look at the last part of verse 12. You will find there is none that doeth good. Good, right. None that doeth good. No, not one. In verse 23, it sums up the entire chapter by saying, For what? All have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the what? Glory of God. Glory of God. Now, what this teaches, Doug, is that all of us are by nature sinners. If there is none righteous, that means I'm not righteous, doesn't it? Yes. And if there's none righteous, that means Kathy's not righteous. Of course, you know she's not righteous already. <laughs> but that means that she's not righteous. Now, that means if there's none righteous, that means that Doug Piles is not righteous, doesn't it? Yes, sir. All right. Then if all have sinned, that means that Jack Hiles has sinned. And that means that Kathy Hiles has sinned. And Doug Hiles has sinned, for all of us have sinned. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. So the first thing we know is that every person is by nature a sinner, and there's none righteous. The second thing you have to know, Doug, to become a Christian is that God has placed a, placed a price on sin. All of us are sinners. There's a price that must be paid, and that price is found in chapter 5 and verse 12, where it says, notice, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world... And what by sin, Doug? Death. Death by sin. And so, what? Death. Death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. About the same thing is said in chapter 6 and verse 23, where it says, For the wages of sin is death. Death. Right. All right. We find then that all of us are sinners, and we find that God has placed a price on this sin, and this price is death. Here's what it means. God made a man, and he made a woman. He put them in the Garden of Eden, and he said, you can eat of every tree in this garden but one, and that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve, you cannot eat of this tree. If you do, you're going to die. They did eat the tree. You remember that? The Catholics believe that, and the Methodists believe that, and the Baptists believe that. So they did eat of this tree. When they did, they died. They did not drop dead physically. It was first a spiritual death, though the curse of physical death did come upon man, Immediately he ran from God and was separated from God, which means that he died spiritually. If a man lives without God, he has to die without God. If a person dies without God, he has to live in eternity without God, which is called hell. Which means, Doug, in the final analysis, sin takes us to hell. The first thing we noticed, that a person is a sinner. And the second thing, there's a price on sin. And that price is death, which ultimately will take the person to hell. Do you understand that? Yes. That's the second thing. Now, so far in our story, I'm a sinner and you're a sinner. Is this true? Yes. And so far in our story, I'm going to hell and you're going to hell. Is this not true? Yes. The third thing, Doug, that you have to know is found in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. And that is that God has paid the price for us. Already, Look at chapter 5 and verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ what? Died for us. Died for us. Now, Doug, what is the wages of sin? Death. Death. What did Christ do for us? Died for us. Right. That means that whatever sin cost, Jesus paid. Does it not? Yes. All right. Then we are sinners, and the wages of sin is death. That's separation from God. Jesus died for us which means that Jesus has paid the price for our sins. God sent His only begotten Son into the world. He was God in the flesh. 
He was virgin born, lived a perfect life. He himself never sinned, so he himself did not have to go to hell, did he? No. But when he'd been here for 33 years, he went to the cross. And on the cross, he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Which means he was paying the price for your sin. He was your substitute, your sacrifice, paying your price for sin. You understand that, Doug? Yes. Now, Doug, the fourth thing you have to know is that if we will put our faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior, God will see that faith and count it for righteousness, transferring all of our sins to Jesus and imputing His righteousness to us, which means that the moment that you put your faith in Jesus Christ, God sees Jesus with your sins and sees you with His goodness. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing today to know that every sin was forgiven? Yes, it would. I know but it would. Faith is a, is a big word. I mean, it takes in... Uh, quite a scope. Yes, it uh, does. You have to uh, you have to live uh, according uh, to the Old Testament and the Ten Commandments and things like this to uh, uh, live a good life too. To well, I think it's heaven. admirable that you want to live a good life, and I think that a person that is saved should want to live a good life. But the thing that happens when you're saved is God gives you His Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes in you to live, and He lives through you the Christian life. He is the babysitter. He takes care of you. Now, we cannot keep the commandments or even live a good life unless we have God's help. And so a person must be first born again, receiving Christ by faith. And when our faith is placed in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in us to live. And then He lives through us and works through us and lets us live the kind of life we ought to live. But it is the faith that makes us God's child. Now, Doug, let me ask you this. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. That's the way you do righteousness, believing. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You see that? Yes. Doug, let me ask you a question. Do you realize today that you are a sinner? Yes, I do. Do you realize that because we are sinners that there's a price on sin, which means that if you died tonight, You'd go to hell. You realize that? Yes, I do. Doug, that's a very serious matter. Kathy is a Christian, and you are not a Christian. If your apartment were to burn tonight, and both of you go out into eternity, Kathy would go to heaven, and you would go to hell. You would never see her again. That scares me, Doug. Do you believe, Doug, that Jesus Christ took your sins and died for you on the cross that you might have eternal life? Yes, I do. Do you believe that if you would be willing tonight to bow your head and say, God, the best I know how, I am trusting Christ in faith as my Savior. And this moment, I, I receive Him. Do you believe that God would take you to heaven if you'd mean that? Oh, I think He would. He sure would. Doug, let's bow our heads and have a prayer. Let me pray that you'd do it tonight. Let's just bow our heads and close our eyes. Our Heavenly Father, I am so grateful that Doug has heard the gospel. Here's a young couple starting out together. They have all of their life ahead of them, but more than that, all of eternity stretches out before them. Here's Kathy. She's a Christian. She's going to heaven. Here's Doug. He needs to be a Christian. I pray tonight that he will say yes to Jesus Christ. Doug, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I'm going to ask you to do something that God will help you to do. I'm going to ask you to talk to God in your own words, and ask God to forgive you and tell him tonight you are receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior. Go ahead and do it, Doug. God will help you. Go ahead and pray out loud right now. I hope you will. I hope you will. Go ahead. Well, Doug, maybe it's a little hard for you to pray. and Maybe you can't think of the words. I'm going to ask you then to repeat after me this prayer if you mean it with all of your heart and you do tonight want to receive the Savior. I'm going to ask you to say to God from your heart now, Dear Lord, forgive my sins. <clears throat> Dear Lord, forgive my sins. And save my soul. And save my soul. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me, a sinner. I do now receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. I do now receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I trust Him to take me to heaven. And I trust Him to take me to heaven when I die. Doug, while our heads are bowed, if you meant that prayer, 
and you did receive Christ as your Savior and are making this the hour of hours in your life, I'm going to ask you as a token of it, man to man, to take my hand. Amen. God bless you. Our Heavenly Father, I'm so glad that Doug has received Christ tonight. I'm glad that he by faith has turned to the Savior. I pray now that you'll help him to realize that if he's been sincere, that his faith has been counted for righteousness, and he's your child. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, Doug. Now let me ask you a question, Doug. Over here in the Gospel of John, in the third chapter, one of the greatest chapters in all the Bible, I want you to see this verse. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Doug, are you believing on the Son of God tonight? Yes, I am. According to that verse, where would you go if you died tonight? Well, I, I'd go to heaven right. according to the verse. Because the Bible says it. Mm -hmm. And that's your hope for heaven. Then Doug turned to Kathy and said, Kathy, I just became a Christian. I just became a Christian. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, that's wonderful. <clears throat> God bless you, Doug. Now, Doug, now that you've received Christ as your Savior, the next thing you ought to do is come to the services. And let me tell the people that you have received him. You, it does not mean necessarily that you're joining the church. It simply means that you're telling the whole world that you are a Christian. Would you be willing to come Sunday to the services? And when the invitation is given at the close of the service, would you be willing to come forward and let me tell the people what's happened in your home today? I believe we could do that. Wonderful. Would you promise God that? Well, yes, I yes, I will. Let's bow our heads, Doug. Would you just say this prayer? Say, Dear Lord... <clears throat> Dear Lord, I do promise. I do promise that I will come forward. That I will come forward at First Baptist Church of Hammond. At First Baptist Church of Hammond next Sunday morning. Next Sunday morning. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Doug. I'll be going. I have a deacons meeting. I'm a little late. Oh. I hope they don't vote to fire me before I get there. So nice to have met you, and well, Kathy, such a joy to meet you. And nice. God bless you, and I'll see you Sunday morning. Bye.